In February this year, I booked tickets to see a magic show headlining Carissa Hendricks. After watching her performance, I fell in love with Lucy Darling. I call Carissa one of the hottest magicians at the moment. Her career is soaring, and rightly so. She's created a character called Lucy Darling, who is daring, glamorous, sultry, sexy, and a wee bit naughty. Lucy is just one of Carissa's performance characters, and I'm thrilled to be here today to speak with Carissa to tap into her creative genius and her perspective on magic and shows. It's my great pleasure to introduce and welcome the terrifyingly talented Carissa Hendricks. Welcome, Carissa. Thank you so much for coming <laughs> on the show today and to share some of your experiences and your insights with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That's so sweet. I love terrifying. Yeah, I have like mixed feelings about that word. It's like, is it because of all the sideshow stuff in my history? Why? <laughs> no, no, no. You are terrifyingly talented. That's a fact. Yeah. <laughs> now, we've mentioned Lucy Darling. Can you just tell the viewers how she evolved because I am in love with Lucy Dart. <laughs> oh, good. I, I try not to be jealous of other people's love of her. Yeah. Um, we love you too, Carissa. <laughs> Lucy doesn't build her own props. She has you build them. <laughs> True, I'm the manager. I mean, I was really in love with the cover of Jeannie that Carrie and I collaborated on because I felt like it's so clearly communicated what I wanted to communicate, like Lucy lounging around drinking champagne and me doing all the work right. <laughs> and getting none of the recognition. Right. Um, but yes, I understand that I am also Lucy and I, it, it's just an interesting uh, kind of internal thing where you're like, oh, that lady, we want to talk about Lucy. Uh, so um, I've done some degree of character in my act kind of from the beginning and I think it came from the fact that I was doing this sideshow act and I am a very well I don't know maybe I'm not self-aware to know what I exactly am but I feel like I am a fairly at the time was very soft-spoken and uh kind of sweet and sort of green you know just sort of like just shiny and fresh and new and uh that didn't really go with the sideshow act so i built almost intuitively this character that was like this adorable daredevil this sideshow darling uh who wasn't who i really was you know she she was just different and so when i got asked to start assisting magicians um i created another character that was this ineffable graceful gorgeous what I thought an assistant should be you know and I would wear these like short cropped wigs sometimes and I you know very specific and then I started doing a lot of circus I started getting into acrobatics and I borrowed a bit from this uh, original assistant character I created but then I you know I made her more Cirque du Soleil I she was a more yeah so everything avant-garde kind of, avant avant-garde yeah and then I got to go to art school Mm -hmm. kind of in the middle of my career in my mid-20s and suddenly this thing I had done organically uh, was given a language and was given a sense of awareness and I was lucky enough to go to an art school that had performance art classes and had um, you know media studies and it talks a lot about uh, archetypes in visual art it talks about uh, how art sees women and all of a sudden this this thing that was just inside of me uh became a thing that i was doing deliberately and then my kid show character got like a lot of interesting edges and got really worked out and uh and shortly after art school after i had been touring a bit after my world record i hit this point in my career where uh it was clear that all of the choices i had been making wanted to be going somewhere specific and i couldn't quite figure out where that was and through a, a a sort of a mystical convalescence of of things uh that place where i belonged seemed to want to be magic and weirdly i didn't take my knowledge of character and archetype into magic because one of the first things i heard when i started doing close-up was wow you know what's great about your close-up is you're so authentic and i heard that mm -hmm. as 
them saying no characters allowed. Magic is already a fantasy. There's no room for character here. But the more I studied the magic, the more I became obsessed with like Pop Hayden and, uh, you know, Zabrecki. Rudy Kobe. Rudy Kobe. Obsessed with Rudy Kobe. You know, since yeah. a kid, I was obsessed with Rudy Kobe. And, uh, and, there's all, and these are all characters. Mm -hmm. And so I'd been doing magic for a few years and going to conventions and building something. And it, it just wasn't quite finding its rhythm. And mm -hmm. finally, it occurred to me like, well, since this is the only art form I don't do a character in, why don't I just like try to, to mix someone up? And uh, I happened to be in Atlanta at the convention that uh, Ken Scott now runs and Zabrecki was doing an extra day where you could take like a one-on-one, -on -one, there was like eight people workshop and it was all day. And so I changed my flight, I bought the course. It was all the money I had at that time. And we, I listened to him talk and he was very well spoken. It was a great lecture, but the most valuable thing I got was that we all got to talk for a second about you know, what we were working on. And everyone kind of talked about something they'd come up with in that room, but I had this thing I'd been thinking of. And so I started talking about, well, okay, I have this idea about a character that is real magic, that isn't a magician, but like uses the language and vocabulary of magicians so that she can like effortlessly just do magic. But the magic isn't very show offy and, and I don't want it to be a witch and I don't want it to like be a wizard. I, I don't want it to be in that category. And so I th I'm thinking like alien. I'm thinking like she's an alien. She's like a classy alien from outer space. And Zabrecki's watching me like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the whole time and like, like giving me nothing and then finally at the end he goes this this is a wonderful idea if you ever need help with this I will this is a great idea and uh and that's all I needed because after that everybody else I told about this idea said it was terrible <laughs> for nine months for nine months I, I worked quietly and I hired an accent coach and I built costumes and I wrote a script and I had original music made and Right. Everybody hated it. Everybody hated it. But Zabrecki liked it. And I respect Zabrecki. And so maybe there's something here. But then there was this voice inside me going like, all these people can't be wrong. So here's what I'm going to do. I know. There's this magic festival in Australia. Never been to Australia. It's literally on the other side of the world. Tim would be- To get further away. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I'll go premiere it there. And then if it's terrible, it'll just go away. And I'll never have to own up to it. So I built this thing. I go to Australia. I mean, there's a little more to the story, but I'm it's getting long winded. But like, I went to Australia. The show was a hit. Hit. It had to be held over for another show. It won the comedy award in Australia. That success got me the castle. Only four months later, right. that castle gig got me another castle gig, and th those two got me the nomination for stage magician of the year the following year. And it's just been, gabuk, 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 you know, like it. It just immediately picked up steam, and it it all came from this like eventual need to like stop denying what I was supposed to be doing. Rudy Colby's Magic Mad Lab Man and the greatest magician on earth were brilliant brand game changers. His look and almost cartoonish superhero style are so distinctive and so recognizable. He continues to wow and stun audiences with his original magic presentations. Yeah, Carissa Hendricks is one of my favorite performers um, because she approaches it in the same way that I do, which is that the character comes first, you know, that it's more that we're presenting more of a movie or a, a live cartoon uh, in my case. So um, there's very few people who look at it that way, who look at the tricks as being part of the story. So Chris and I hit it, hit it right off the bat. Fabulous. And uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, did you meet? yeah, I met I met Carissa a couple of years ago. I was on tour doing a lecture tour of Canada, okay. and then my last show there was sort of a. Um, it was a performance, it was a, you know, a big a show for a magic convention or something. So she opened for me and then um, we as Lucy started Darling? talking. Yeah, she opened it for me as Lucy Darling. So the show was basically an hour long and she did the first 45 minutes and I did 15 minutes. And then, but I suggested, because um, we really got along, that we do something together. So we ended up doing um, Harry Anderson's um, famous straight jacket and rope escape, you know. So I got to perform on stage with uh, Lucy Darling. Yeah, the very first time I met her. 
yeah. and then I was I was able to uh, invite her a couple times for other shows here in the U.S. So I've worked with her a, a couple times now, and yeah. um, and it, she deserves all the success that she's gotten. That's what you did. You followed your gut. You followed your intuition, and it and and that was true, and it, it paid off. Yeah, I'd say until the world ended. Now I'm just sitting here. <laughs> but even that's not true because even then, as Lucy Darling, you presented a full on uh, live streaming show, which was very ambitious and very successful. Yeah, it was really fun. We didn't, we've done a couple now. I've hosted as Lucy for some other shows as well. And uh, I've got another one on Sunday, but it's a private one. So I've been doing some like private Lucy Darling things. We have a surprise guest today and I'm thrilled. Hello, how are you? Oh, I'm doing fabulous. How are you, Lucy? Most of Darling, I'm always fabulous. I have the last little bit of a, of a sidecar, the last tiny dregs, which means I am this happy. How do you cope with the adulation of your fans and... and the, well, I don't have to cope with it. I indulge in it, darling. I love it. I, I After every show in Chicago, I would come out and talk to people. It is my favorite part of the show, getting to meet people and find out what it meant to them. And, and I've noticed that one of the lovely things is, I don't know if you know, I have these little pins. And peep, this is sort of a secret. So I'm telling you, but you can't tell anyone else. But the secret is... The pins are different colors. So there's a, a copper-backed pin, which is the one fans can purchase. Then there is a silver-backed pin that only gets given as a gift to people who help in the show. So the front row in the show becomes part of the show. And so I feel it's only reasonable that I should reward them for their efforts. So they get little silver Lucy pins. And then the gold ones are ones that are, that are gifted for like other professionals. And so if someone comes up wearing a pin, I can tell if they were in the show or if they're a fan. So sometimes people come up and they have their little pin on and then I secretly know something about them. So that's very fun too. So I, I have no problem coping with adulation. That's a, that's a Carissa problem. She has a lot of trouble with compliments. She cannot handle them. I'm the opposite. I live on compliments. I use it as a face cream. So I have no wrinkles. Flawless. Although now I suppose I have quite a few more silver pins because I'm not doing live shows. I'd have to mail people who help with the show the pins because there's no one. Virtual pin. <laughs> it's a virtual. That's a good idea. I should send people a virtual pin. Yeah. Mm. I think that part of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic lockdown, one of the benefits is that you're forced by yourself to reassess what's important and to reassess um, career-wise what you need to do to uh, carry forward. And this is a brilliant opportunity to develop ideas and skills that, that you know, normally you wouldn't have the time to, to do and, and to collaborate with people that you normally would be too busy, but you have this opportunity right now. So, I mean, for every negative, there's a positive, but you're, ta you're taking this negative and turning it into multiple positives. And so I can't wait to see what you come up with. I can't wait. It's, everything is so exciting. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. So, you know, yes, it's a, a terrible time for many people and not to diminish that. But if you can try to apply the positives and apply yourself and just use this time in a proactive way, it's, it's fabulous. Yeah. Keep going back to Lucy, darling, because I think I, I, I recall hearing like this isn't something that just came easily. You did vo vocal coaching. You've, you've really worked hard for this. It seems effortless when, when uh, we watch it, but there has been a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that's gone into this character. Can you kind of just explain a little bit of your process and how much work has gone into her? Sure. I think uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious if any of the people I've been coaching right now are listening because they're like, we know the blood, sweat, and tears. We, she makes us do it because <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's a lot of work developing a character in a way that makes makes it feel organic is exhausting because you have to know what that character wants and a good character is is a is when a whole bunch of disparate elements come together the look is right the sound is right the posture is right every choice you make as a character and then there's also this whole thing about you know a real person when i talk to you there are sort of two conversations being had. There's the words I'm saying, but then the words I'm saying betray some secret information that maybe I'm trying to hide from you. Or the way I say it, you know, betrays my passion in, in ways or like, or if you ask me a question and I answer it more, 
you know, stiffly, then maybe there's like secretly something. There's that, subtext. And, yeah. Subtext. Yeah. That is something that real people have all the time. Mm -hmm. Characters have to have for them to feel real and complex. And in order to have that, even if you don't share it, like I don't, and none of my scripts do I say, hi, I'm an alien from outer, I'm a fancy alien based on Q from Star Trek. Like I, just, I never say that. I yeah. don't need to, because they're, you're just sort of pick up on this otherworldliness, this confidence, and like she's flirting, but it's all non-committal because you're not even her species. Right. You know, there's this, it's, and people are like, oh, she should have a husband. And I'm like, who would she marry? You're a different species, <laughs> you know? And, and so that secret knowledge I have mm -hmm. helps me layer in these subtext pieces and these elements. And then also my character and some environments need, I need the act as the actress to be able to peek through the character and be like, we're all playing pretend. Yeah. Remember? Like every once in a while, in a, on a very rare occasion, she will refer to the wig because I'll, some, I'll go too far or something, I'll make an audience member uncomfortable. Yeah. And a really nice way to like pull the ripcord on that is to go, this is not real. Mm -hmm. Everything's fine. This is a magic show. Right. This is a wig. Right. It's okay. It's just a really nice way to like pull the ripcord, but you right. don't want to, you know, a lot of people like they're, they do a character, but the character winks at you every two minutes. Yeah. And it, it's like, ah, oh, just let us, for you know, I don't mind a character peeking out from behind the veil once maybe twice but for the most part i want to be allowed to participate in the fantasy that we're seeing and right. i don't need to know that you know that i know that you know you know and so there's a lot there's a lot that goes into a good character and the hardest part is that i have a very bad habit of over intellectualizing everything and that's a really good first step for creating a character but at a certain point you need to let her be a person flourish yeah yeah and so so I had all these rules for her, and then she started on stage betraying some of my rules. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, why are you betraying that rule? What do you want? And then you have to kind of reanalyze and go, oh, maybe these things I thought about her aren't true. And so I would go revisit my old scripts and see how far the new script had migrated. And, right. But then also sometimes your script migrates because you can get lazy. <laughs> yeah. You got to look and go, oh, I'm being lazy this mm, be less lazy so like there's certain things in the script that I started doing that were that were me that yeah. were things that I do in my close-up show and I had gotten lazy and they had crawled into Lucy's show mm -hmm. and I had to find a new way to like you know and often that happens because you haven't considered that so right. the character has a lack of information and that lack of information is being filled with self and that's it's a lot of conflict and then every once in a while Lucy will come into my actual life and fill holes where my personality is missing. Right. Yeah, no, it, it's brilliant. And um, I think it's so insightful. And I very much like the use of character and how you actually have built a complete complex personality with this character and, and made her, and she's real. And we'll have clips of Lucy so the audience can enjoy her as <laughs> I do very much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll let you go. Thank you so much, Carissa. Have a good weekend. Uh. You too. Bye, darling. Bye. Remember to subscribe and comment below.